Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. Now I'm in Atwater. At this time, there's a lot of things going on. You know, we had cell phones sent in. We had other stuff sent in. I'm doing good. I'm living my life in a penitentiary the way I want to do it. But also there's a lot of Conf there's a lot of fucking shit going on with this motherfucker that I mentioned in the last video, Boracho. I'm trying to wrap around my head. I'm trying to plot and scheme and figure out how I can get this bitch motherfucker knocked off because you know, at the same time, no matter how you feel about a certain situation and stuff, everybody wants that black and white. They want to kite that he sent to the SIS, or they want a statement that he said in court. They want some in black and white, meaning in writing, legal documents that show that this dude's foul. I can't produce that. He didn't tell on his case, he's got a life sentence. So when he comes through the penitentiary, he shows his people his paperwork, and they clear him by the paperwork. But they don't know that he's doing all this foul ass shit. <clears throat> why he's in the penitentiary doing time. Now, I don't know how long he's been working for these fucking uh, police guards, but I know without a doubt at all that this dude's fucked up. This dude got two cell phones knocked out of our unit, one from Lowe and one from me. And the day that I pushed up on him that morning, you know, a few days later after my home, after we just came out the shoe from getting our cell phone knocked, I pushed on him with the kite that the homie wrote me. A couple hours later, this fool was pushing his property out of my unit into 4A. Now, I know where everybody lives. Everybody on the compound, if they're anybody, if they're if they're hustling, if they got money, if they're making moves. I know who they are. I know what unit they live in. The unit that he goes to has another cell phone in there. And the cell phone is, is this Puerto Rican uh, older dude named Trevi. Good, quiet dude. He walks around the yard. He got a fat ass gold chain. Everybody knows him. I think he's out of New York. Everybody knows him as a hustler, but he's quiet. He's never out there. Everything he gets is just a pass on to somebody else. I've done a few business transactions with him. Good individual. So when the opportunity came, when those phones came through, he was one of the persons that I hit up to see, because I know he's got the money to afford it. Because $2,500 is a lot of money for fucking, for anything. You know, so <clears throat> I'm not going to go around asking every Joe if they want to buy a cell phone, one, exposing myself, and two, having frivolous conversation with individuals that have, don't have the financial means to do what, you know, to spend the money. So every conversation I have is targeted. And I know these people that move and shake around on the compound. So everybody that I went to that presented them an opportunity of, uh, to, to acquire the cell phone, they all jumped on it and got one because they know it's rare and they know the $2,500 investment is going to make them tens of thousands of dollars down the road. <clears throat> because our issue in the penitentiary is having a secure line of communication with the people outside in the world. Especially if these individuals are individuals of means that have resources and things going on. So I provided them, so I gave them an opportunity to, to acquire this and he jumped on it, got himself one. <clears throat> well, this Paracho dude moves over to 4A. Not even a week later, the police run in that cell, not in the cell, but in the unit, because I don't know what cell he lives in, runs in the unit or whatever. The rumor comes back that they locked Tree V up. They caught him with a cell phone. <clears throat> now I'm in my unit kicking it, and uh, a DC dude comes to my block, I think, 
when he's in the morning, I'm doing whatever I'm doing in the unit. DC dude comes to my block and say, hey, Kenny wants to holler at you. Kenny is DC. His older brother's name is Mo. Not Larry Mo, but, you know, it's uh, Mo. He's light-skinned, big. They both got life sentences. <clears throat> you know, I don't know exactly what their case is, but both Kenny and Mo used to live in my block. So through the course of time, we built a rapport with them. Mo moved out to 3B, but once a week, he makes his uh, little mustard chicken. He sells bowls. You know, I think uh, he think it's, he's selling for like a, a book and a half, 15 stamps of bowl or whatever. <clears throat> and every time he cooks, he always come and haul me and ask me if I want a bowl. And I always buy like five or six bowls from him. So every week when he cooks, you know, we have like an <clears throat> ongoing agreement. Because, you know, I like to support everybody. Anybody that's doing something, if I got the financial means to support them, I'm going to support their hustle. Because these individuals support mine, you know, whatever. We, we built a relationship, so we're always helping each other out. But also, I'm not just supporting them. The food that he cooks is good, and I want to eat it, and it saves me time to cook. So what's, you know, 10 books for the whatever five, six bowls that I get from him? <clears throat> So Larry, or not Larry, but Mo and Kenny are brothers. So the DC comes to my unit and asks me that Kenny wants to holler at me. So I come out <clears throat> and uh, it's Kenny and Mo. They're like, hey, Mason, man, we want to holler at you about this dude, this Baracho dude. I say, he, you know, you know, you just heard Trevi got his cell phone knocked too uh, a couple days ago. I said, yeah, I heard. And we all think it's this bitch motherfucker that just moved in our block. And I told him, man, I know it's that bitch motherfucker. I know, I know in, in my heart of heart that this dude is a freaking jailhouse rat. Well, again, prison politics handcuffs our hand to a certain extent. Only in, to the point where you're fed up with it. So, Mo and Kenny being from D.C., you already know all their DC homies gonna back their play. And me, no matter what I do, because most of the, for most of the part, the things that I do are always on the right, on the right side, with as far as like integrity and honor goes. So if I decide to put my myself in a situation, the homies gonna back my play because they know I'm not just gonna put myself at risk or put the people around me at risk over some dumb ass shit. Because they know I fully understand that things in the penitentiary get serious real fast. So Kenny and Mo come and holler at me and say, hey man, we wanna bring this shit up to Garcia. Now Garcia is the guy, that's the main guy for the Paisa. He's a spokesman for the Paisa. He has the yard for the Paisa. <clears throat> But he doesn't speak English too much. You know, he doesn't. I'm pretty sure he understands a lot more English than he than he leads than he, than he lets uh, leads on. But every time you speak to him, we always bring an interpreter so that way there's no misunderstanding. <clears throat> so they say, "Hey man, will you come with us and back our play, or we can holler at Garcia about this do boy?" I said, "All right." <clears throat> So, but before I go with Kenny and Mo to go holler at Garcia, I want to put my homeboys on point. Because no matter what your expectations is or what you think or how harmless you think a conversation is, this conversation can have a significant ramification. One, we're accusing somebody of being a rat. And we're accusing them of being a rat we can't prove it. So when we bring this issue up to Garcia and then if they ignore it and brush us off, then we have to do something because you're not gonna bring up an accusation like that, even a conversation like that, if you don't have the willingness to see it through or see that it gets taken care of. So when we bring this conversation to Garcia, we're letting him know we don't want this dude on his compound no more. And if he says, oh, this, oh, that, or whatever, 
than for us to tuck our tail, bow down, and walk away. It's going to make us look like we're a bunch of bitches. Why even bring the conversation up in the first place? So before we even have the, con the conversation, we have to decide that if it doesn't go the way we want it to go, then we're going to enforce it. So before I go with Mo and Kenny to go talk to uh, Garcia and his interpreters, I find my homeboy, Eddie, Eddie Sua. I go to him and I explain to him. I said, hey, man, this fucking dude, this Baracho dude, we really believe that he's been the one getting all these cell phones knocked off of the compound. I said, them DC dudes over there want me to go with them to go holler at Garcia about this, about this situation. <clears throat> and he's like, all right, yeah, go. So I'm just out of respect for my homies, out of respect for their, for their safety. I always want to make sure they're hip to the situation. Now all my homeboys are on point. So even though they're not coming with me to the conversation, no matter what they're doing, they got their, their eye on the conversation. Because if something happens right there, they already know the procedure. Find yourself a paisa and start punishing them. Because the guy we're speaking to is their shot caller. He's the one that speaks for the whole paisa organization in Atwater. So he's got eyes on him everywhere he go. He's got security around him. And they're not gonna allow a couple, some black dudes and, some, and an Asian dude to put their hands on him or beat him up or anything without them react, retaliating or reacting. So all the DCs on the yard is on point. Their stations spread out around the compound. My homeboys are on point. They're in position all around the yard. Like no one's in grouped up watching because I'm not a person that wants to create a scene. I'd rather have a private conversation with you than be loud and boisterous and group up and cause a scene. Because for me, if you group up and you start barking and, and growling at each other, then nothing happens me seeing it as a spectator, I feel like that's a, you know, that's a knock against them because why are you barking and growling and don't do nothing? It just makes you look stupid. So I'm always conscious of those kind of things. So after I put my homeboy on point, Kenny and Mo got their homies on point, we go to Garcia. He got, he's got three or four bices around him. One of them is acting as an interpreter. The other ones are his security. So we approach him, we tell him, hey, I lead off with the facts. I don't have no paperwork. I don't have nothing in writing that's gonna say that this dude's a rat. But I'm telling you right now, what happened in my unit, what happened in 4A, we know he's a rat. I told him that I told him that he was a rat to his face I called him a bitch and a rat in the cell to his face and a bitch motherfucker, instead of popping me in my mouth, sat down. We're all men in this conversation. We all understand that if someone making an accusation towards you, to you, slanders your name in any type of way, your pride is gonna defend itself. You're not, if you're not a rat, homie, you're not gonna allow someone to accuse you or put that label on you. And if someone is brave enough or disrespectful enough to be able to accuse you of that to your face and it's not true, your natural reaction is to bust his jaw. So at every opportunity when I poked him and disrespected him, he just kept putting his paws up and trying to get out of the conversation. So. When he does that, it just confirms my belief. So we tell Garcia, I said, hey, that dude's a rat. Now we're just letting you know, we can't prove it, but we know what it is. So we're giving you the opportunity to deal with it, or we're gonna deal with it. That's the only way you can have a conversation. You can't just say, hey, uh, this guy is this, this guy and that, uh, what are you guys gonna do? 
You give them an ultimatum. We're giving you the respect to deal with this situation. And if you don't, we're going to remove him. But you don't want us to remove him because when we go remove somebody, we're going for their lives. We're not going to be beating up somebody and sending them off on their way. We're definitely not going to be dropping the kite and having the police come pick him up. No, we're going to punish him. But Garcia tells me, yeah, he's under the Paisa umbrella, but he's a Paracho. This is the first time I knew what his name was because Paracho is not his real name. Paracho is his gang, and it's a gang, it's a Mexican gang out of Texas. He said, yeah, we can't really do anything to him because he's a Paracho, but we're going to bring it up to his people, and they're going to decide, and they're, we're going to leave the decision to them. And there was only like maybe four or five barachos on the compound. But now the cat's out of the bag. This conversation is, is already had. So there has to be something has to come from it. Either this dude gets removed from the compound or we're going to remove him. But this dude, now that we had this conversation about him, can no longer stay on the compound. Because if he stays on the compound, it's going to make me and the DC, Mo and Kenny, look stupid for bringing up the topic and not be willing to do what's necessary if these guys refuse what we ask. You know, but at the same time, we're telling him, we don't give a fuck how you remove him. But he can't be on his compound no more and he cannot be here after lunch. So we left the conversation at that. And we shook me, we shook hands. I gave Mo, Kenny, dap and hugs and went about my business. <clears throat> Well, after lunch, he was no longer there. They just checked him in because all his homeboy wasn't on the compound. He was a barracho, but the Pisces went and told him he had to leave. So he went and checked in and got locked up in the shoe. I'd rather have seen him get, I'd rather have seen him get chopped up, get smashed out. But at the end of the day, he was removed from the compound. Well, a couple of days later, one of his homeboys come out of the shoe, another member of his Paracho gang. He comes out, he knows my name, he looks for me. Somebody's like, hey man, there's this guy, Mexican dude, Paracho dude, wants to speak to you. Now, I go speak with him, but when I go, I'm aware, I'm conscious, because I'm the face that called his homeboy a rat, and I don't got no paperwork. So, I'm not knowing how he's going to re receive that. So I, when I go, I'm prepared that if this is going to be an ugly conversation, I'm going to deal with it. But I'm hoping it's not. But I'm not going over there like, yeah, I'm just, you know, rinky dinky, whatever, happy go lucky. This is a serious conversation because I've accused one of their gang members as being a fucking rat. So the dude comes, he's my size. I size him up. It's just an automatic, like I always tell my wife, I operate on a subconscious level. I'm not planning and planning my next move or whatever. I'm reactive. And when I get into a situation, it's like I'm on autopilot and I'm able to survive it and do what's necessary, you know, to ensure my safety with every situation I've encountered. So I size him up. You know, I've been around people long enough to see how they move, how they walk, or been aware of people on a compound through their daily routine. We're all creatures of habit, so I know who works out all day. I know who's got good condition. I know who knows how to fight. I know who knows who carries knives, and I know who's lazy. I know who just sitting, it's out of shape. These are just things that data that you collect. It's just. And all of it is just to help you survive the environment that you're in. Your, your senses, your awareness is all heightened. It's always on high alert because no matter if you're just kicking it, snap of a finger, the whole yard can blow up. I've seen it. I've been in it. So I'm very aware of my situation. But I size it and I, I you know, even though I feel like if something happens with this conversation, that I'll be able to whoop this dude, 
and be able to take care of myself and defend myself, I'm not underestimating him. Because, you know, when you're fighting for your life, you never know what kind of strength, what kind of determination and energy you can pull forth to help you survive. So I have a conversation with this other member of the Baracho gang. He asked me, man, what happened with his homeboy? I said, your homeboy's a rat. I can't prove it, but here's the situation, here's the scenarios, and here who's all in the shoe. And everything, there's like five people in the shoe by this time that had an encounter with this bitch. I said, the only common denominator with these dudes in the shoe is your homeboy. And I explained to him, that, yeah, I called your homeboy a rat in the cell. And I called him a bitch in the cell. You know, if I said that to you, you'd be trying to stab me. At the very least, we'd be fighting. And he agreed to me. He said, yeah. So if I called you a rat, if I called you a bitch, you didn't do nothing to me. My jaw ain't on the side of my face. That means to me and to everybody else, you're probably guilty of what of the accusation. So he said, yeah, you know what? And the dude that I met, I don't know his name because they all just call himself Baracho. But he shook my hand. He, you know, he thanked me for bringing it up to him, for explaining what was going on. He said, don't worry. I give my word. I'm going to deal with it. So I guess the next day, he does something to get himself locked up in the shoe. Either he went through the metal detector with a knife. He did something to cause himself to go to the shoe, the guy that I just spoke with. When he went back to the shoe, it took him about maybe a week or two weeks to finally get in the cell with his homeboy. Because his homeboy probably don't want any other people around him because the word is out that he's fucked up. Because as soon as that dude, that borracho, the rat, went back to the shoe, the SIS made him an orderly. Like, back in the days when I first went into the penitentiary, only solid dudes were orderlies. Orderlies are the ones that come out, clean the hallway, help you pass kite, get you water, you know, pass you commissary through your people, whatever. These jobs were reserved for solid dudes that people can trust. Because even though you're in the shoe, you're still willing and dealing. There's still stuff being brought into the shoe that for you to sell stuff out of your cell, you got to have someone pass it to another tier and to whatnot. So most of the time, when we're in the shoe in the beginning of my bid, they were solid dudes that people trust. But now, the only ones that get to work and be orderlies in the shoe are fucked up dudes because these COs, they're tired of dealing with convicts. You know, outside the cleaning, whatever, like, oh, you can't pass that kite or you can't pass that commissary or whatever. The convicts get to tell them, hey, fuck you. I'm not out here to work for you. I'm out here to work for the inmates that's locked in their cell. So over time, the CEOs got tired of that because they didn't have no control over the orderly. So now the only ones they put in those positions in the shoe are a bunch of fucking rats. So the dudes, it's a fucking orderly in the, in the, in the, in the shoe. But finally, the baracho that I spoke to gets moved into the cell and I get a kite from Bryson, because Bryson is still in the shoe. Bryson and Jay and a couple of other homies that for other things are all, you know, we had at that time, we had about eight, nine homies in the shoe and they're in three cell, three to a cell, four to a cell. Look, I don't know how you do that. I'm not sitting in a fucking cell that's barely big enough for me with three other of my homies. I don't give a fuck how much I love them, you know? So anyway, they sent me a cat out. They said, hey, uh, that fool got fucked off by his homeboy. The dude I was speaking to on the yard, the one that got himself locked up, ended up being that dude Sally, ended up fucking him off. I don't know how bad or to what extent that he hurt the dude, but he X the dude out from their Baracho game. You know, I appreciate that there's still individuals out there that still stick to the principles, the integrity, the honor, respect, and loyalty. And that when somebody comes up that's foul, that they're gonna take care of it. It's the only way that we can exist. It's the only way that we can prosper. 
is by only keeping good people around us. When you have fucked up dudes, it's only a matter of time before it contaminates the whole. If you know you got people around you that ain't good, don't ever be have the mentality like, oh, he told on that dude, he's not gonna tell on me. If he told on somebody one time, I promise you, he's gonna tell on you. Welcome to the USP.